First of all, wow. Uh, I speak to groups, and I've spoken to groups of two. <laughs> and uh, I, I once spoke to a group of 300. Uh, usually the groups are much closer to two. So <laughs> this is really, really nice. Uh, but we'll have to have, actually, I have some good friends here. So when I get excited, I talk loud. So if all of a sudden it sounds like an ACDC concert in here, my friends give me a turn it down. Uh, I am not used to the technology, and actually the one thing I retained was Elizabeth said, don't have it on when you go to the bathroom. So <laughs> I thought, OK, I'll do that. So this is a, a different crowd than I usually speak to because, uh, and I'm not saying this to be self-deprecating, but I guarantee you that most of the people in this audience know far more about the islands than I do. So I appreciate your coming. Uh, I'm not an expert on the islands. This book, Islands Apart, A Year on the Edge of Civilization, really isn't even about the islands in, in particular. I mean, the islands were sort of a foundation to look at, at broader things. Uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the park for having me. Uh, and if not for the park, this book never would have happened because you can't just go traipsing around taking notes on a national park without somebody's permission. And uh, the park was so nice to me, and they, they just made everything happen, along with Island Packers, who got me out on their boats. And when the boats weren't available, the park flew me around, and I, I really felt like a celebrity. And it was probably the only time. But uh, <laughs> it was nice. I, I'd also like to give a shout out to uh, there's so many people do so many things for the park. And, and I know probably, again, 80% of the crowd falls under that category. But I would like to give a shout out to a group of people who quietly work to help to do good things for the park. And it's the Channel Islands Park Foundation. So I won't embarrass you by calling out your names. But I will embarrass you by asking you to stand up and uh, wave. OK. OK, uh, now I'll make a liar out of myself. Uh, the smallest member of the people who stood up, uh, Tigran, is one day going to be Secretary of the Interior. So be nice to him. <laughs> I've never seen a more remarkable young man, something else. And uh, the last thank you, besides thanking you all for coming, is to my uh, lovely wife, Kathy, who uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I do without her help. And let me tell you, when you're writing a book like this that requires a lot of time laying on your back and looking at the sky, and then you find cell reception somewhere on the island, and you make the mistake of calling your wife at 6.30 at night, and she's an elementary school teacher, and you have two young boys at home, and she asks, how, are you, how was your day? And you say, well, I laid on my back and pontificated, and you hear this deep silence. <laughs> you, you have to marry an understanding woman, and so I appreciate everything you've done for me. Thank you. So I'd like to talk for a little bit about the joy of solitude and the importance mostly of moments. Um, again, I, this has been done before. I'm not the first person to uh, espouse this, nor, am I, nor do I have any answers. Uh, I, I just uh, I felt sort of like my life, my own life, and I'm probably the least important person on the planet. I feel like two calls a day, and if I get more than six emails, I feel really, really important. But I still felt like my days were getting away from me between the technology, between the rush, between the to-do list. And I sort of wondered, you know, at the end of the day, really what had I done that mattered? And, and the answer often was nothing. And if it involved yard work, it was still nothing. <laughs> so the idea behind the book was really pretty simple. I thought, I'm rushing to the end, and I'm missing so much. I was on a Grand Canyon trip once for a magazine uh, 18 days down the Colorado River, which was magic. And probably half the crowd has done that trip. But uh, I, I got to be good friends with a, a German gentleman. And he was about 68 at the time, Raymond. 
And uh, one day we were standing by the river watching the sunset, and I asked Raymond, who was like a mountain goat at 68, he was like everybody, he just dusted everybody on the hikes, but I, I asked him, why did you come? And he turned to me and he said, I can see the horizon. And I thought, right, and the horizon could be anywhere for us. So I think we need to make the most of the moment while the moment's here. So that was the basic gist of the book. Uh, I went to the, hey, just out of curiosity, and this isn't meant to put any pressure on anybody, but how many people have read the book? And if only one person holds up their hand, wow, all my readers are here. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Well, uh, well, and actually, it's funny. This, that's a sweet thing to say. This isn't a sales pitch. I didn't come here to sell books. I bought books, but um, I'm the world's worst salesperson. So don't feel the need. Uh, don't feel like if you stay to the end that you're going to have to buy a book. Every once in a while, people just get up and leave because they're bored or they didn't bring any money. So <laughs> if, if it's the first, you can go. If it's the second, you should stay. So for the book, I went to each of the five islands in the national park, and I spent a week on the islands alone. I never really was alone, but I did try because, you know, obviously there are rangers and researchers. Uh, but I, I tried to time the trips so that there were very few people there. And it's not like I dislike people, but it's about solitude. Some of my friends were kind of confused about the book when I first got the assignment from Random House, and I started telling them, they're like, dude, I'll go with you. I'm like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> just don't say anything for a week. <laughs> so I spent a week on each of the islands, and then I also did things in between on the mainland, and I think uh, this is also a very important part of the book, that I thought sort of reflected both our current times and also sort of underlying threads that have been with us forever. I spent time up at Arlington West. Has anybody been up there where they put the crosses out in the sand? Initially they did it for the Iraqi dead every Sunday up in Santa Barbara by the Santa Barbara Pier. Yeah, I, I spent uh, time up there and uh, that was uh, kind of a sobering experience and that underlying theme was war because war is something that's always been with us. I spent time at a soup kitchen in Beverly Hills. It was actually an Episcopal church. And uh, the premise behind that was uh, kindness and poverty. And I also learned that the food there was righteously good. And uh, people would like come. I got to be very friendly with the minister. And uh, he said, people, and I saw them, people would come in their Rolls Royces and park down the street and then come walking in for the buffet because it was a pretty good one. And, uh, I also learned that uh, a lot of people who are, are less fortunate than us are uh, also much more polite than us. Uh, a big line would form every day, and I would get in that line, and I wasn't fooling anybody. I'd come off of one of the islands. I forget which one it was, and uh, I hadn't shaved, and I probably hadn't showered, and so I was pretending to be homeless, and I don't think I fooled anybody, but the thing that was so interesting to me is that the, the people would queue up in a big line and wait really patiently uh, for, and if somebody, there were a few people there that weren't all together there and they would just walk to the front of the line and nobody complained. And one day before I came down, I stopped at Starbucks, I don't know why, and uh, I was standing in line and two people almost got in a fight over who was first. And I just thought, I mean, nobody's perfect, we all have our flaws, but it was an interesting education. So one of the islands, the first islands I went to was uh, San Miguel. And, and sometimes people ask, well, what's your favorite island? And, and I hate to answer that question because they're all really beautiful. But I think if I was really pressed, I would say San Miguel and Santa Rosa just because they're far, far away, like they say in Shrek. And it's really, they're really, how many people have been, again, all the hands will go up, to San Miguel? OK. And Santa Rosa? Wow, OK. I love this crowd. So I don't have to read anything. You guys can just get a drink and go home. Uh, I arrived on, on San Miguel in March. And it was just after the spring rains and the Coreopsis were blooming. And uh, you probably know this, but San Miguel's campground sits in the middle of a, one of the largest stand of, stands of Coreopsis on the Channel Islands. And they were blooming when I was there. And here's a brief passage that just sort of shows you uh, what you might see if you just stand still. This is on the campground. 
at the campground in San Miguel. And I spent the day hiking with Ian Williams, who uh, quickly became one of my favorite people. Uh, Ian is very, I'm sure people here know him. Uh, he, he looks like Opie from, uh, yeah, and uh, he's very, has a wry sense of humor, very quiet and an observer. So anyway, I'd spent the day on a Bataan death march with him out to Point Bennett <laughs> because Ian, Ian was in a hurry and I wasn't. So, because I tend to stop and take notes and Ian wanted to be home before Tuesday. So he would follow right behind me like he was shepherding a sheepdog. So anyhow, we, he finally, he got me home in time for his own dinner. And this is what happens when you, I was alone in the campground, and this is just a passage, what we miss sometimes. That evening, I ate lasagna from a bag and watched the world go dark. The gloaming came on as discreetly as dawn had arrived. Nature feels no need to beat her chest. Twilight deepened, but a spectral glow remained. The sea of yellow coreopsis flowers seemed to throw back the light of the departed sun but the bushes still stood silently before the falling night like a respectful crowd. As it grew darker, the world lost the sharp edges of reality. In the distance, the peaks of Santa Rosa Island flattened. Close at hand, the Coreopsis dissolved so that lollipop bushes, heavy with lemon drops, could indeed exist. In the darkness, lovers become who you want them to be. At the very last, the blackest sky bent down and kissed the earth. How often do we stand outside and watch darkness fall? Not often enough. So I know we've all had moments like that, but I think uh, sometimes we miss them. And uh, it's such an easy thing to do to just uh, let it pass you by. It was interesting, the psychology of solitude, too, because, uh, again, I wasn't entirely alone. But uh, you know how we're, we are sort of conditioned to I just started wearing glasses, and one of the first things I did before I started wearing them was sit on them. So <laughs> they're kind of crooked, I'll take it. Uh, so I hope that doesn't put anybody off. You feel like you're at sea if I turn my head back and forth. Uh, the psychology was interesting because you, we are so conditioned to do things. And uh, so in the early going, when I was heading out to the islands, I sort of mapped out this insane schedule in my head. Uh, I like to exercise, and on some of the islands, you have to bring your own water. So I'd have these gallon water containers. So as I'm riding out on the boat, I'm going through all this in my head. It's like, OK, so I'll get up, and I'll watch the sun rise. And that'll be 6 to 6.30. And then at 6.30, I'll take two gallon water jugs, and I'll hike around the island for an hour. So and then at 7.30, I'll fix breakfast. Then at 8, I'll clean up. And then from 8 to 9, I'll pontificate. I mean, it was the weirdest behavior in the world. But we are. It was like I felt like I, I don't know, it was sort of overwhelming to spend a week with nothing to do. So it was really, really funny. And I quickly learned how to do nothing. And some people in this crowd would say I've been a professional at that. But <laughs> it really takes some doing. So here's another brief passage. And uh, this takes place on Anacapa. And Anacapa is interesting because uh, it's small, as we all know, a little over a square mile, and treeless. And when I called Reserve America to make uh, reservations, the nice lady, I'm not sure where they are, but she knew what, where Anacapa was and what it was. And she says, oh, so you'd like to spend the weekend? And I said, no, I'd like to spend the week. And she's, there's this stone cold silence on the <laughs> other end. like. You know, when you just have no idea what to say. So, but this is what happens when you slow down and, uh, you know, realize that you don't have to rush everywhere. It's, uh, I, I'd spent the day hiking around the island. I'm on Anacapa. I've finished dinner, and there's nothing on TV. So I decided to walk up to Inspiration Point to watch the sunset. One evening, an hour before sunset, I made my way toward Inspiration Point, passing through the small Coreopsis forest that runs along an upsweep of the island's ridge. I had just suffered a depressing dinner, and the oncoming night didn't look so hot either. At dinner, the wind kept blowing the tuna right off my fork, and, al <laughs> and already my tent was performing push-ups. The wind continued to gather steam even now, though it had been whopping without surcease in my one working ear since dawn, 
perhaps hoping to complete its task of rendering me as wild-haired and deaf as Beethoven. In short, I was feeling sorry for myself, and at first glance, the half-dead Coreopsis didn't do much to lift my spirits. But I found, if I hunched low, the waist-high plants afforded some small windbreak, so I stopped amid the forest, motionless and half-bowed like some paralyzed monk. A strange thing happened. With nothing else to do, I observed the Coreopsis closely. It was true they reeked of death. Their stalks were mottled as old hands, and their ends held not flowers but drooping strands, thin and withered as a skeleton's final hairs. Within this relatively quiet glen, there was a familiar sound I couldn't quite place. Closing my eyes, I listened until it came to me, the hiss of sand running through fingers. The wind spat salt spray. I felt it against my cheeks. Salt is something few life forms relish, but upon the Coreopsis stalks, life flourished in the form of dozens of tiny lichen. Reaching out, I gently ran my fingers along the plant's drooping strands. Surprisingly, they possessed the moist suppleness of hope. I had forgotten my appointment with the setting sun. Nearly on the horizon, it now bathed the entire miniaturized mossy forest in gauzy gold. The Coreopsis bobbed agreeably. I realized that I had been standing stock still for nearly an hour. Why is it that we want so much when so very little will do? Coreopsis lie dormant for nine months, erupting with brilliant yellow flowers come winter's rains. I gazed again at the mottled patches and smiled. They did not remind me of death. In my mind, I saw again the hands of my 90-year-old grandmother clasping, nay, fairly crushing, the arm of a frightened five-year-old great-grandson she had just met, holding this new life as if it were a treasure not to be believed, a bridge to renewed hope and possibility. And then here's what happens when you don't pay attention. And I'm as guilty of this as the next person. This is also in a kappa. When the island packer's boat arrived on Friday, a dozen day trippers trooped off. I looked at them with their white bright socks and their crisp new Land's End jackets, <laughs> tilting back their shiny Diet Cokes. They looked at me with my scrubby gray beard and weeks coating of dust and wind-blown food bits. I joined them as their naturalist took them on their guided hike. My gear already rested, packed up and ready, down at the landing cove. A woman sidled up beside me. Do you live here? <laughs> I love. Sometimes as a writer, things happen, you think, this can't be true. No, I said, I was just camping. For how long? A week. Really? Why? <laughs> I chose the easiest answer. To see what it was like, I said. And what was it like, she asked. I smelled perfume. Quiet, I said. And in the beginning, kind of lonely. We hiked past the empty campground. The two wooden johns stood still and regal as royal palace guards. I didn't realize it was going to be so deserted, she said. What did you think it would be like? I thought there would be houses out here. I read something in the literature about not disturbing the residents. This is like a Robinson Crusoe island. <laughs> we had reached my Coreopsis forest. I stopped to say a silent goodbye. The woman turned back to me. What are you doing, she asked. Just taking in the scenery, I said. She shook her head. Everything's dead and brown, she said, before continuing on. So again, I'm not poking fun. Well, I did poke a little fun. But uh, it's just interesting how you can have two different takes on, on the same thing. As we all know here, and again, some far better than I, our islands are home to, I mean, all sorts of amazing things. But again, San Miguel is one of my favorite islands, and probably because uh, it's home to one of the largest gatherings of wildlife in the world. And I was fortunate enough to be out there most of the pinnipeds had left by, I mean, a large number of them had left by then. It was just after they come and uh, just coincidentally to, to breed uh, just around Valentine's Day. I don't know if there's any connection there. But I was there again in March, and a fair number of them had left. But uh, Ian hiked me out to Point Bennett, and uh, just what I saw there just gave me hope. I think we all understand sort of the disconnect between the islands and the mainland. And I love it here. I mean, I, I, sometimes people give me, take me to task. They, they're like, you only spent a week on each of the islands. And 
I think because of the title, it was a year-long uh, sort of effort writing the book. I mean, the travel's on the mainland too, so it's called Islands Apart, A Year on the Edge of Civilization, but there's been a few reader or a few people who have taken me to task because I didn't spend a year on the islands in a loincloth with a big <laughs> butcher knife surviving on island foxes. So, uh, but it is the disconnect between the mainland and the islands, as we all know, is stunning. And to see wildlife in its natural state and to see it in such abundance, it just, it just makes your heart lift. So here's a, a brief scene from San Miguel uh, out at Point Bennett. Ian led me out to Point Bennett. And I know it's not right to give animals human characteristics, but I don't care. I wrote the book, and I did. <laughs> so, Ian led me out to Point Bennett, a desolate outcropping of white beach and dark rock, where we knelt behind a rise in the dunes and snooped on yet another sprawling pinniped gathering and also glimpsed the spouts of gray whales. The beach at Point Bennett was populated with a mix of sea lions and elephant seals. And far up in the dry sand, Ian pointed out some northern fur seals, too. Most of the elephant seals and sea lions were down near the water's edge. And the longer I watched them, the more they assumed human characteristics. The male elephant, seal, the male elephant seals made their slow, rippling way through the crowd, like distinguished gendarmes. The juvenile sea lions swaggered along the water's edge like strutting teens. And, my personal favorite, out in the waves, the dark forms of small pups played as if no one was watching. For a time, I amused myself by watching a female elephant seal rebuff the advances of a mildly amorous male. Inchworming close, he would drape an enormous proprietary flipper over her. In response, she would use her own flippers to douse him with sand before moving away. This repeated itself at least a half dozen times. Oddly, it brought to mind several of my own early courtships. <laughs> it was a scene reminiscent of the Jersey Shore or Coney Island, a mass of life swaying to nature's urges. Of course, pinnipeds are nothing like us, but the thought was entertaining, and I am easily amused. All that life sprawled on the beach was encouraging, too. And truth be told, these blubbery forms littering the water's edge were only the tip of the iceberg. Point Bennett, like Cardwell Point, had already largely emptied. Some 25,000 sea lion pups had been born on San Miguel during the summer just past, Ian said. Performing simple extrapolation, pinniped researchers figured on 25,000 moms and at least 25,000 males and juveniles during the breeding season. 75,000 sea lions in rough sum, never mind the other three species of pinnipeds. It was immensely reassuring to see that such places still exist, though mildly disconcerting to think that one day, quite possibly, they may be all that survives. Back at home, newspapers were stacking up in our living room, their headlines trumpeting diminishing fossil fuels, thickening ozone layers, and psychopathic despots wielding nuclear arms. Several days earlier, I had asked Ian how the island was recovering after a long history of habitation by man. San Miguel, Ian told me, was gradually returning to itself. The thought made him smile. Like they say, he said, nature bats last. So I really, uh, how many of you here know Ian? Yeah. I don't know what the Park Service does to hire these people, but they're perfect. I mean, <laughs> Every ranger I met during my travels was just, I mean, they were incredibly calm. I'm not saying that because I'm at the Park Service. Uh, but they were so competent. They were thoughtful. They were funny. Uh, they just, they were just a joy to be with. And uh, they were also very finicky about uh, uh, safety, which I found kind of annoying. But uh, <laughs> I guess they, was sort, what's that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't know, but it's sort of funny on San, San, the only island I was totally alone on was Santa Barbara Island, and uh, so they gave me a radio, and the basic decree was don't kill yourself, but if you do kill yourself, end up close to the radio, <laughs> so you can at least say something and we can find your body. <laughs> uh, and it was also pretty funny, too, because... Uh, 
life's too short to be too professional. So because I was the only person out there, I had to call in every morning along with the real rangers. And I think I give the barometric pressure and the temperature and the wind speed. So, you know, I wanted to do it all right. So I'd get up at like 2 in the morning and wander around in the dark reading all the gauges just to make sure I had it right. And then everybody would get on the radio one at a time. And for some reason, they always made me go last. And so each one of the rangers would get on, and they would just professionally give each of the details. And, and one day, uh, I professionally gave all the details, and then I just couldn't help myself. I said, oh my god, it's so beautiful out here. <laughs> and again, there was stone cold silence. And the dispatcher, who I forget who it was, uh, Dora, or, she goes, that's very nice, Ken. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so. And again, um, oh, with, with uh, Williams in mind, and uh, I'm a big fan of uh, both Ian and his wife, Marcella Klein Williams. And she spent a lot of time out on the islands as Ian's wife, and their kids uh, spent summers out there. And after she read Islands Apart, she wrote me a really sweet note. Uh, but that sort of got to the heart of the matter. Uh, she said, solitude often leads to boredom. And boredom provides the motivation to look with curiosity at the things that would normally be brushed off in the hurry of a typical day. Though she also admitted to desperately calling friends. So, and it, sometimes I, I, as a travel writer, a lot of times people will also ask me, well, where was your favorite place that you've ever been? And uh, I've been to some amazing places, but, and I think we all know this, but the things that have really made an impression are, on me are the people I've met. And I think that's been the biggest joy of writing is I've been able to meet some amazing people. And some of them are in this room. But, and you take a little piece of them with you. And uh, they don't even have to be alive for that to happen. Uh, and I know that sounds wrong, kind of Jeffrey Dahmer-like, but it's, that's not what I mean. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite places during my island stay was uh, Delphine's Grove on Santa Cruz Island. You guys hiked past that or sat down in that little grove of cypress pines on Santa Cruz. As you're approaching the island, I'm directionally impaired, so I don't know if it's north, south, east, or west, but to your left. Uh, <laughs> and you'll see sort of this vast Serengeti plain of grass. And then there's this stand of cypress pine that just looks so incongruous, like it shouldn't be there. And uh, there's just a, a great inspirational story behind it. It's, it's just a short distance from the campground, and it's as glorious a place to kick off your shoes and stare at the sky after you've worked a really hard, long day as any. And it's named after a young girl. And the very existence of Delphine's Grove, I believe uh, there's a wonderful lesson in that. So here's a brief passage about Delphine's Grove. You don't have to hike far from the campground at Scorpion Canyon to find solitude and solace. I found mine in Delphine's Grove, a spot as lovely as the name itself. Delphine's Grove is a small stand of cypress pines. The grove is easily reached by a short hike up Smuggler's Road. The huddled trees sit on a sloping hillside high above the water amid a Serengeti plain of grass. Like the eucalyptus in the campground, they supply dappled shade and protection. But unlike the towering and somewhat lordly eucalyptus, the cypress pines were small and approachable, like a knot of close friends. Each time I stretched out beneath them, I knew I had come to an oasis. It is now one of my favorite places in the world to daydream. But I'll tell you why I really like Delphine's Grove. I liked it because it shouldn't be there. Delphine, the oldest child of Justinian Kerr, who supervised a ranching operation on the island that began around 1880, planted her fledgling cypress on a slope bereft of water. In my readings, I could find nothing telling me why Delphine planted her cypress trees where she did, but anyone's rational guess would be for the view. For the grove looks out to the water, across the Santa Barbara Channel to the mainland, and it is a heart-squeezing expanse of white caps and hazy blue coastal ranges. The farthest distances fascinate us. They raise a simple yet absorbing question. What is over the ridge, beyond the horizon? The far distances inspire us to explore, to conquer, to migrate. It is the reason many of us are where we are. At some time, one of our ancestors packed up a few things and set out to see what was over there. And now we are over there too. 
The unseen distances are metaphorical, too, places of possibilities and imaginings. For a young girl on an island, the blue mainland might have swum with lovers in a more exciting life, but only Delphine would know. Everyone's distances are different. It's what makes us unique and often inexplicable, even to those who claim to know us intimately. Husband and wife stand at a ship's railing, fingers intertwined, looking out the secret horizons of which they will never speak. Delphine's Grove is also a great place to worm off your hiking boots and listen to the wind in the bowels. The sounds are different depending on the wind and the leanings of your imagination. Sometimes the wind is simply the constant drum of distant breaking surf. Sometimes the wind passes in distinct gusts, like trundling trains passing as you wait at a railroad crossing. Sometimes the bowels themselves creak, making the sound of a porch swing rocking slowly, its occupant riding gravity and memory. Winds can be like songs. They take you back to forgotten moments. But winds can only do this if they are carefully attended to. And this is not easy in a noisy world. Solitude helps one remember. And this is not just an exercise in pleasant memory. Solitude often recalls the things that really matter. So I gained inspiration and well-deserved rest from Delphine and her grove. And I love the fact that that was sort of a long-term rebuttal to naysayers. Uh, sometimes I talk to writers groups and, and people will say to me, uh, I want to be a writer, but everybody tells me I shouldn't do it. I should be uh, pretty much anything else. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I love people who just uh, buck, buck the odds, and, and Delphine did. And uh, her grove is, is testament to that. As I said, other themes run through the book, and the chapters and visits that take place on the mainland, they do have underlying themes. And the last chapter in the book uh, takes place at Children's World Preschool here in Ventura. And uh, the reason is because I wanted to end the book on a note of hope. And there's no more hopeful place than one filled with three to five-year-olds. Uh, the nice thing was, too, they gave me uh, complete access because... Uh, in my one position of responsibility, years before that, our two children went there, and I was a member of the board. So uh, when I came back, they knew uh, it was relatively safe to let me wander aimlessly around three- and five-year-olds with a notebook, writing down pretty much everything they say. And actually, three- to five-year-olds are really interesting. But here's a, a few lessons I learned at preschool. And I have great, I was talking to two young ladies in the crowd, well, wasn't a crowd at the time. I thought they might be the only two people here, but they got here early. And I was talking to them and their uh, environmental, uh, they're studying environmental science at Oxnard High School. And I said to them, I have great faith in this next generation. And I do. Uh, I think we've, uh, we've done maybe not the best we could, our generation, uh, but we did what we did and, and uh, we're still trying. But the next generation, I think they're going to have some, some difficulties on their hands, but I think they're perfectly capable of, uh, of taking care of it. And uh, some of these three- and five-year-olds, I wrote this book in 2009, so they're getting ready to launch onto careers of their own. But here's a few lessons I learned at, at preschool. There was much talk of peace in Mrs. Streeton's classroom. A sign on the door proclaimed it the happiest place on earth. But we are imperfect, even in our innocent, unconditional form. One day I caught the tail end of a small uproar. Someone had pushed Alec to the ground as he was getting a drink from the water fountain. At almost the same instant, two girls were in the bathroom, one urging the other to follow her lead, which she did, both of them plunking their hands in the toilet. When it, when it rains, it pours. So immediately, everyone came into the classroom to discuss things. First, we lay on the rug and listened to imagine. Then the children sat up. Mrs. Streeton sat in her chair in front of the class. I have some things to talk about, Mrs. Streeton said. Remember how we said we're all a family? Well, I'm unhappy with some members of our family right now. It doesn't make me happy when members of my family are doing things that are very, very wrong. Everybody waited quietly. Mrs. Streeton continued. You have to treat each other with respect and you have to know how to make good choices. When somebody says something to you that you know in your brain is wrong, you need to be an adult and make the right choice. Of course, Mrs. Streeton and I all knew that adults don't always make the right choices, <laughs> but we kept that secret. They would figure this out soon enough. 
I'm very, very sad now, Mrs. Streeton said, because right now it isn't peaceful in our home, and only you can make that change. We are going to work really hard to be a peaceful classroom. We need to do peaceful things. Someone asked, will you tell us when we do something peaceful? Mrs. Streeton shook her head, and there was a short murmuring of surprise. You won't have to ask, she said. You'll know. There was nothing but breathing. Peace is easy to practice in stillness. The real challenge is practicing peace at the height of the storm. I hadn't seen Alec pushed, but I had witnessed the immediate aftermath, Mrs. Streeton moving quickly over to the pusher and reprimanding him in no uncertain terms. And then she took his hand. The next morning when I arrived at Children's World, the boy who had pushed Alec was presenting him with a card. Apparently, this was a matter of both forgiveness and practicality. He said to Alec, keep it. That way, if I push you again, you already have a card. <laughs> it's just, that's just too good. So I, I did mention, and I'll, uh, I'll wrap this up, uh, the people that you meet are often the, the, the real joy of writing. And uh, one of the other chapters, I spent time at a Benedictine monastery uh, in the desert at Valiermo uh, uh, outside of Lancaster. And, and I met a gentleman named Father Eulotherius. And I often talk about, you hear the term, the wisdom of strangers. And uh, I've, I've run into a lot of wise strangers. Uh, since I met him, he's passed away at age 100. And because of this, the world's a slightly emptier place. But when I met him at St. Andrew's Abbey in Valiermo in the desert outside Lancaster, he was 98, nearly blind, barely able to walk, and full of life. His mind was razor sharp. When I met him, he was sitting on a fold-out chair beside this little path. And it was February in the desert, so it was cold. And he was a little guy. He was wearing a down jacket. And at first, I thought somebody had just left their jacket on the chair. <laughs> But he had, uh, yeah, just he was he was a joy. I was a little afraid when I went to this Benedictine monastery because I'm not very versed in religion, and I thought I was going to commit some gaffe and be staked out in the desert. But <laughs> turns out the monks have a wicked good sense of humor, and uh, everything worked out fine. But uh, it was interesting because he had uh, bright eyes and a few teeth, and whenever he made a point. Uh, he would stab a mitten finger in my direction and smile really wide. And it didn't matter that he only had a few teeth because uh, his smile was like a broken shutter and sunshine comes through a broken shutter. Uh, we hit it off. We talked a lot. And uh, he probably figured that I was in sore need of some wisdom. And uh, as, with Father, as with Delphine, my favorite thing about Father Eulotherius was trees. Uh, he came to St. Andrews in 1961, and when he came there, he was a gardener, and so he started a garden, and he wanted to plant a sequoia, and all the other monks said, it's not going to happen. You can plant it, but it's not going to last, and so when he planted the sequoia, it was about as big as his finger, and he went ahead, he watered it, he cared for it, and when I visited him 50 years later, the tree was 70 feet tall. So here's a last passage and uh, another small lesson before we uh, open it up to any questions. Father Eulotherius held up a mitten finger. The mitten had a hole in it. He poked the finger in my direction. The sequoia sapling, the trunk was no thicker than this. You know what is interesting? To see things grow in life. First, the family, the children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and the garden. According to my 98-year-old mind, the greatest gifts are life and love and family. Do you have a family? Yes, I said. Do you have a wife? Yes, I said. Love her, he said. The morning I left, Father Eulotherius was nowhere to be found. So I did the next best thing. I walked up to the garden and said goodbye to his tree. The desert wind was blowing again. The boughs tossed themselves in a showy fashion that made me smile as Father Eulotherius had smiled with a touch of happy madness. I remembered his words. When I am gone, people will come here and say, what is a sequoia doing in the desert? And someone will say, oh, it was planted by a crazy man who did not know. So I urge you all to make the most of your moments. Thank you.
Oh, right. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, we'd like to open it up to question and answer period now. A couple of things. We will have uh, a drawing after the question and answer period. Ken has been kind enough to offer a few of his books, so some of you may have a lucky chance to finish reading that passage about the three and five-year-olds. <laughs> um, but another reminder, just before you ask your question, please wait for me to come to you with the microphone uh, so that everyone will be able to hear. So with that, if anyone has any questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, uh, again, I try to avoid people for the most part. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure, March, October, uh, February, November, and then I came to Santa Cruz Island in uh, Memorial Day because I thought that would be kind of a fun, yeah, contrast. So that was timed intentionally. And it's interesting. I mean, we all, a lot of the people in this crowd know this, but it's, it's like any national park. Uh, all you have to do is wander 10 minutes from the campground, and you're on your own. Uh, so even on Memorial Day weekend, it didn't take long to, to get off by yourself. So, But yeah, so that's to answer your question, yeah, sort of the off months. Any other questions? Dave? You talk about your solitude. What, what's the longest period that you went without meeting or interacting with anybody? And what was your sense of self at that point? Actually, that's a really good question. I never, hadn't really done the math. When I was on Santa Barbara Island, I was there for a week. But researchers showed up about halfway through that trip. And I greeted them like, a, like Tom Hanks. And yeah, you know, ah! So yeah. But what was also fun is that uh, you know you, you do it takes some effort to be with yourself. I don't I don't think anybody's more critical of ourselves than ourselves, and uh, I I think it's really hard for people, including myself, to enjoy your own company, and so that really took some getting used to, you know. And I found that I like myself generally, but uh, you know the things I would like to improve. But it was also true that being alone on Santa Barbara Island and uh, I, uh, some, several people said, don't put this in the book, but I did. I was able to like dance on the patio naked <laughs> to, to music I liked. And the naked part's not off-putting, but my dancing is. <laughs> so, so, I mean, the naked part's probably off-putting, too, but the, the dancing is more so. But, so the longest period of time probably would have been about three days. And, you know, you're always connected. Uh, but I made a real attempt. I mean, on a lot of the islands, you don't have reception in certain places. And when I did, I tried not to get, I didn't get on a phone or a computer or, you know, like at the Santa Barbara bunkhouse, I think you can get on the internet. And uh, I did listen to music, and I won't tell you why, because I just did. But uh, other than that, I, I tried to stay disconnected. So it wasn't really solitude in the sense of like walking off into the wilderness, but uh, when I wrote Islands Apart, the publishers called it a Walden for a new time, which made me really nervous because I'm not Thoreau, and it's 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 a it's a funny book. I mean, Walden sounds so heavy, and I read Walden in high school and really wrestled with it, and then I took it out to the islands with me and had a little bit easier time. But the more I read of Walden, the more I realized how much I had in common with Thoreau, and that he wasn't some great outdoorsman, and his mommy brought him cookies at the cabin, <laughs> and. You know, I, that's why I call my mommy. And, but, so, yeah, uh, not too much time totally alone. You've probably spent more time alone than I have out there. I know you have. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wondered what did you do about food? Like, did you just your own Yeah, I, I just brought my own things. But because I'm a great outdoorsman, I just would bring, like, cans of tuna fish and open them out and eat, eat them raw out of the can. And, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to travel light. I also was confused about like the Island Packers drop-offs and things. So when I got off at Santa Cruz, I, I forgot that they drop you off at Scorpion. Then they make another trip around the island. Then they come back and unload all your food. 
So I, I walked off onto the pier, and suddenly I realized I'd forgotten all my food. And I thought the boat was gone, and I was going to have to survive on Island Fox, which again is problematic. So I mean, they were making a comeback, and what's one fox? You could make it last a week, I guess. But, uh, but it's, it's camping on the islands is very, very easy. Uh, you know, but it's interesting too because I, I'm a minimalist just because I can't cook, so right away I don't have the stove and everything. But it's funny to watch what people bring out to the islands. You know, I mean, I guess there was a day and age where people would bring entire grills and, you know, yeah, so I travel pretty light. But, yep. Yeah. No, no. I mean, they have fire, yeah, pits and things on some of the campgrounds. But, yeah, fire really frightened me. And uh, so I didn't do anything. And it was interesting, too, because I, I sort of got on a more of a natural cycle. I'm not a big night owl anyhow, but when it got dark, I went to sleep. And sometimes I went to sleep because I was so damn depressed. It was so windy. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take it anymore. You know, I, I had a real, again, my friends are much uh, more outdoorsmen than I am. And so initially, I was going to take a dome tent. And I'd taken that dome tent once to Mexico on a surfing trip, and I was sitting next to my friend, and we're sitting there watching the waves, and we see a dome tent blowing down the beach, and we turn to each other and go, look at the idiot who didn't. <laughs> so my friend Ed gave me a really low-lying tent, but even so, I still thought I was that the, the wind beat the tent down against my face, so I really thought I was going to be the first person to suffocate in breathable fabric. And it's just like... <laughs> So, but sometimes I went to bed at 5 o'clock because I just couldn't handle the wind anymore. But then I woke up at 4.30 and I saw the sunrise. And it was really nice. Yes? Did you make friends with the mice and did they get in your book? Uh, well, the mice did get in my book because, uh, I'm, uh, and I think I'm a minimalist. When I was out on Anacapa, these two guys came out to camp. And I, they camped next to me and we got to be friendly. And I, the first thing I noticed was that they had like almost no gear. And they opened up their backpacks, and they had like, I think, three bottles of Jack Daniels and, <laughs> and two sleeping bags. So their approach was to just get smashed and then pass out in the dirt. And then I would wake up in the morning, and they'd be like this, and the mice would be like, Bruh. So, but and they were actually really smart guys. One of the guys had worked on one of the commercial fishing boats, and so he was telling me about how much they used to catch. and how the catches had dropped off. And it was interesting, because this is such a great town and such a small community. Somebody, I forget who, that I, what's that? Oh, Ventura, just this whole area. So somebody who I know vaguely ran into these guys and said, hey, you know, you're in this book. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we brought the Jack Daniels. And the, you know, because you never know if you're going to run into those guys and going to punch you in the face. But <laughs> I just told the truth, so. Yeah. Yes. Is that Jane? Yeah. Hi, Jane. <laughs> so I'm interested in the process of writing the book. Did you go from island to island and take notes that were basically disjointed and random, and then later you wove them to a story thread? Or did you go in island to island with already a concept of how you were going to outline the book and the story between the two edges of civilization. Yeah. I had no idea. I mean, uh, there's sort of two schools of thought with writing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And one of them is to map everything out ahead of time and have an outline. And the other is to just go. And I, uh, I like the go one. So <laughs> I would just, uh, that's very complicated. I can go over that again. <laughs> Nobody understood that. Um, so what I do with all the writing assignments, including Islands Apart, Jane, is I walk around with a notebook and I scribble everything down. And it's uh, observations, because I don't have the greatest memory for starters. Like I'm always amazed by writers who are like, I was halfway up Half Dome, and then they recreate this entire conversation, which they couldn't have taken any notes. Or maybe somebody picked up their notebook at the bottom of Half Dome and <laughs> wrote the book for them. But, so I, I do. I take a lot, a lot of notes. And the thing that's interesting to me is uh, how much I forget. And so that's why it's really fun to take notes, whether you're a writer or just keep a journal, because it's amazing the things you forget. And it's also amazing to me how you can be standing in the middle of a, a field taking notes, and people just walk around you like you're totally normal. So 
Uh, yeah. So, and then I came back and, and I needed sort of all the material before I could really figure out how to write the book. So the actual traveling between the islands and the stuff on the mainland probably took about seven months. And then it took me another, and then things were sort of coming into my head, like how it might go. And it took me two and a half years to write the book. So as a writer, you never pay attention to how many hours you put in, because if you get look at it by paid by the hour, it's like a <laughs> negative figure. So, yeah. But it's a wonderful, a writer once said, it's not a great living, but it's a great life. And uh, I would agree. Yeah. Yes? Oh, uh, actually, are you like a plant? This is great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I I, uh, I do have uh, roughly ten books, and I'm actually working on a series. I have two of the books already out, and it's fiction, and it takes place in our oceans. And uh, somebody called it Cerebral Jaws, which sounds kind of funny, but I try to write a page turner, and it's about the changes that are taking. I mean. We all, a lot of people here are intimately familiar with what's going on in the oceans, but things are changing. You know, we're dumping all these toxins in, the water's warming up, behaviors are changing, scientists are observing different behaviors they've never seen in different kinds of species. So the premise behind the book, with the books, is what would happen if the oceans fought back? So, and I didn't, it's like when you buy a new car or buy a car. And you never saw that car before, and then you buy the car, and then you see it everywhere. It's like when I decided to do this book, every day, and that's no exaggeration, articles would pop up in the newspaper or on Yahoo or whatever, you know, marlin attacks boat, uh, squid exhibit behavior, never be flash colors scientists have never seen before, octopus uses a shell as a tool. You know, so I just took these kind of real world uh, happenings and wrote, now two out of three books. I mean, I'm working on the third right now. And it's really fun because there's sort of an environmental underpinning to it. I, I mean, Sylvia Earle's coming here soon. And uh, I actually use her in the book. But she, uh, um, you know, she said that the decisions we make in the next 50 years will determine whether we survive. Uh, and she's really, you know, I'm not, a, I believe in us. I think we will because that's what we're hardwired to do is survive. We'll figure out a way. But at the moment, you know, the UN's talking about fishless oceans by 2050. I mean, there's statistics for everything, but we have some serious issues. So part of the reason behind this book was to entertain. But if, like, if you read the first one, and I won't do a spoiler alert, and you get to the end, you'll suddenly realize, oh, yeah, yeah, they're out. I mean, my last name is McAlpine, and uh, just to show you how much inanity is on the internet, if you type Ken McAlpine into the internet, all this stuff will come up. My past criminal record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's probably better just to go directly to Amazon. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's, uh, the first book is uh, called Juncture. The second one just came out about two months ago. It's called Nexus. And the last one, uh, it doesn't have a title because I'm only about eight chapters in. But thanks for asking, yeah. So the fiction's nice because uh, my first two books were nonfiction. And I had to travel and be away for a while. The first book, I was gone for six months, called Off Season. And I thought, I want to stay home with my family. So I just sit in a dark room and make things up. People, <laughs> people give me a wide berth. It's like, yes, Miss Marjorie. They're fabulous books. I sound like a parent. Oh. They're really good. And um, I was wondering if you had a date of uh, completion for the. Now I can't wait for. The oh, book. the last one. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I, I uh, that's uh, Marjorie's a good friend. In case you didn't pick up on that. Uh, I'm not sure. It takes. You know, because uh, I'm working pretty much nonstop. Well, you know what? Uh, that's always the ultimate compliment. You know, George R. R. Martin, who wrote the Game of Thrones books, right? And now the TV series going through the roof, the HBO series. He couldn't write fast enough, so he was actually getting hate mail from fans. You know, but I think that's like the ultimate review. You know, like if you don't finish that book, I'm going to come over there and shoot you. You know, so. I mean, I'm not asking people to do that literally, but so I'm thinking probably about a year and a half. Yeah, it's a long. Um, there's all the research. It's interesting with writing. You try to do a lot of research to make it real, and so I mean, I have some familiarity with the ocean. My whole life, I've spent around the ocean, but you know, there's a lot of research. Aren't you sweet, though? I have to look up some of the names. I'm not sure what's going on, but I was I've learned it. Oh, good. Well. 
Marjorie has some underwater experience, like tons. So that's nice. Any other questions? And I, before we go, heartfelt thanks. This is a great crowd. I mean, honestly, uh, you never know how many people are going to show up. And, and I have no problem talking to two people, although they might have a problem listening because it's hard for them to leave. But uh, <laughs> this is really nice. It makes me feel really good. So. Oh, right. So we're going to, uh, this is highly sophisticated. Uh, Elizabeth had people sign this when they came in. So I'm going to give away two books, and this is how I'm going to do it. Hold on. <laughs>